Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lee. I'm an application scientist with GATAN. Um, I specialize in cathodal luminescence, and today we're going to go through uh, nanophotonics um, using cathodal luminescence workshop. Um, characterization of nanophotonic devices far below the diffraction limit. Um, <clears throat> just a note uh, in the interface, I think my image is a little bit large. Uh, you are allowed to resize me. Um, for comfort, and you can view the slideshow a little bit better. Um, if you have any questions during the slideshow or uh, during the presentation, please uh, submit them using the questions pane on the right of the screen, uh, and we'll try to address them uh, whenever we can. Um, um, the schedule for today is I'm going to talk for a little while to introduce uh, nanophotonics and their applications. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to David Stowe, who's going to discuss uh, the Monarch Pro cathode luminescence system, um, which we've used to collect the majority of the data in the presentation. Um, after that, we're going to jump into a practical session on uh, the microscope, where we're going to capture energy momentum spectra of photonic crystal, um, where I'll be operating that. Uh, so to begin, I'm just going to refresh uh, on what is cathodal luminescence, and um, so luminescence is the emission of photons from a solid when excited by an energy source. So there are lots of different ways that we can excite light from um, from materials, and uh, so photoluminescence, electroluminescence are examples of that. But basically, we just introduce energy into a material, and then we get light out, and that's the luminescence process. Cathodoluminescence is whenever the excitation source is an electron, uh, an excited electron beam, um, which most of you are probably familiar with uh, from the past using uh, cathode ray tube-based televisions, or CRTs. Um, so this is basically a, a form of cathodoluminescence, where the focused electron beam rasters across the screen to generate an image. Cathodoluminescence, we typically concern ourselves from the UV into the near mid-wave IR. So here's a depiction of um, the electromagnetic spectrum, and I've highlighted the region that CL is typically relevant. Cathodoluminescence microscopy uh, is whenever we use an electron microscope, um, which impinges on a sample. Uh, it creates what we call a generation volume from which the excited electrons in the sample uh, excite a number of processes, including secondary electrons, backscattered electrons. Um, among those processes is um, cathode luminescence, which we're going to concern ourselves with today. Uh, it allows us to correlate optical and chemical and structural properties from macro to nanoscale. So we can look with very, very high spatial resolution at a sample. So we're basically piggybacking off of uh, the electron microscope's ability to focus. Uh, it's a very, very, very small uh, spatial resolution. Um, the way that we uh, collect the information or collect the data is uh, we bolt on um, a cathode luminescence detector, and then insert an arm into the beam's path where the beam passes through an aperture in the mirror. The light's coupled back into the system for analysis. So cathode luminescence microscopy is a, it's a fantastic uh, analysis technique because it's non-destructive uh, and it has a very, very high spatial resolution. Um, it's ideal for a variety of specimen and applications, which include Photonic and plasmonic energy momentum mapping, which we're going to discuss today, uh, charge carrier dynamics in specimen, uh, stress and strain mapping, crystal defect mapping, and device characterization and failure analysis. So I mentioned uh, the spatial resolution is uh, one of the key advantages of cathode luminescence. And essentially here you just have a, a secondary electron image of some uh, gold palladium nanostars. And so the, the spatial resolution allowed from electron microscopy is very, very small. Uh, you can see a depiction of the spot size there. And so here you have in the center an SE and on the right uh, a CL image of, that, of a single gold palladium nanostar. And what you can see here is that the, the nanostar is so small that to excite this with uh, a luminescence technique like photoluminescence or any of the um, far field optical techniques, 
is that the spot size uh, for those techniques would be very large. So it would be nearly impossible for you to get this sort of spatial resolution um, that we see here. Uh, on the right is a polarization filtered image, uh, CL image, of such a gold palladium nanostar, actually this one. Um, and what I've done is angled a polarizer such that the light that we uh, that we get from the specimen uh, is accepted through a polarization angle. So if you look along the blue axis, you see that we get a bright on the edges there. And so that's consistent with the dipole radiation that we would expect from a specimen of this shape. So uh, we far surpassed uh, the optical diffraction limit in this case. So it's a, it's a really simple example. All right, so uh, today uh, we're gonna talk about uh, photonic and plasmonic specimen. So we need to understand what is a band diagram or a dispersion diagram. Uh, so typically uh, these crystal structures are periodically structured uh, dielectric materials um, and they can demonstrate photonic band gaps. Uh, what you normally see in a band diagram is a plot of frequency or optical frequency against the wave number uh, K. And so this is kind of what uh, you would expect uh, in free space, for instance. Um, <clears throat> so these are the bands that you would expect to see, but then the the overlapping of the bands at the edge generate a band gap. So this is a one-dimensional photonic crystal. So it just, we changed dielectric, uh, the dielectric coefficient uh, periodically. So, 1D photonic crystals were discovered in the late 1800s, and it, uh, it was not until a, about 100 years later that two-dimensional photonic crystals were uh, studied. Um, a two-dimensional photonic crystal adds an extra dimension of uh, anisotropy. So if you go from 1D, which is uh, like slabs, two-dimensional is like posts. Um, and then three years after two-dimensional photonic crystals were studied, uh, the three-dimensional photonic crystal was proposed. Um, so there are lots of unique applications for either of these um, photonic crystal types. Um, <clears throat> so of interest are the band diagrams, which we can observe uh, band gaps. So you may find um, band gaps over a subset of, of different criteria. So in a hexagonal or a triangular lattice like we see here, um, basically what we have is free space in the white regions and a dielectric coefficient of 12 in uh, the green regions. And so this is the sort of uh, dispersion diagram that you would generate from a specimen like that, where we can see uh, along the gamma to M direction, maybe there's not very much of a gap, but it's obvious from the M to K direction um, <clears throat> where you can see a transverse magnetic gap. And so the, the gaps may exist over a subset of wave vectors, polarizations, or symmetries. It really just depends on the formulation of the crystal. So the, you know, how large is A, how large are the pillars in relation to A, and then what is the coefficient of the dielectric? So as an example, uh, I present a study from Hikaru Saito where um, they were able to, using uh, plasmonic, or uh, I'm sorry, um, metallic nanodots on an indium phosphide substrate, um, the same triangular lattice, they uh, generated a plasmonic crystal on the surface. All right. Wherein they were able to observe using CL uh, the full band gap in that case. So <clears throat> the band gap is generated and then you can observe it using CL just by looking at uh, the wave vector versus energy. And so that's something you can experimentally observe using CL, which we'll demo later. Um, if you introduce, if you were to introduce uh, a line defect in such a plasmonic crystal, you would allow uh, the coupling of um, surface plasma polariton guided modes. So you generally uh, basically generated a waveguide. And you can see the behavior uh, differs depending on what wavelength you're observing. And so 
what we're looking at here are uh, CL images. So you can see the intensity of CL across the surface. Uh, and you see in the waveguide, you can see the standing waves and you can see them kind of decay off to the edge. Uh, so an interesting thing for a researcher to uh, observe in that case would be the propagation loss parameter, where if we take a line plot or a cross section of those intensities down the waveguide, you can determine basically what is the rate of decay uh, along the waveguide. So you can determine the feasibility of using this material or uh, structure as a waveguide. So photonics applications include um, a myriad of, of things, including optical detection, telecommunications, high power lasers, waveguides, and optical computing, and uh, high resolution displays. Now the displays is actually a really interesting um, type of application because researchers are looking at you know new ways to um, to improve the output of micro LEDs. So we're trying to improve resolution, but also not overload power consumption. And so a way to do that is to go into the third dimension. So this is um, uh, an LED photonic crystal where um, using a bottom down top up approach, uh, these indium gallium nitride gallium nitride core shell pillars. Uh, were grown in an array. Um, <clears throat> and so it, it's interesting to look at um, the behavior of structures like this because if it were to be used as a display, then we would need to observe any anisotropy or any isotropy in the, um, in the emission. So we actually looked at that uh, and we um, presented this in a, a previous webinar, but Generally, uh, you can see a schematic of the of a pillar over on the left, and then uh, we're looking at two different pillars. Uh, these are SE images. Uh, one that's out of the array, so this is an isolated pillar by itself, and then a pillar that's in the array. And so that's uh, the panchromatic CL image. Um, we took spectrum images where every pixel in the image contains a spectrum. And if we look at different points across the surface of that pillar, we see slightly different emission spectra. So if we compare to the LED pillar that's in the array, and I can do some color band extractions to maybe illustrate that, you can see that the, um, the defect band is greatly enhanced, uh, especially at point one. So at the tip of the pillar, in the array, there's some enhancement that's going on in the defect band. And so that, um, that's been attributed to the behavior or, um, to being included in, in the array. So we're gonna examine that using angle resolved cathode luminescence. So basically we can look at the spectrum all day, but it doesn't tell us anything about um, what angle that light is coming out. So where is that uh, anisotropy pointing to? And so angle result CL is a great way to analyze. So here's a, a schematic of the specimen sitting beneath the electron beam. And so what we'll do is we'll introduce our uh, collimating mirror. And so once the sample is positioned uh, at the focal point beneath the mirror, um, the light should be collimated. And so if we project an image of the back plane of that mirror onto an array detector, uh, it turns out that every point on a paraboloidal surface projected along its axis is unique. And so what that means is we can um, trans, uh, transform back to uh, the solid angle. So every pixel on the array detector corresponds to a segment of the solid angle emitted from the sample surface. And so this is typically the shape of uh, the back plane of the mirror. And then that is uh, you know, a typical emission pattern. So we can transform that into an ARCL emission pattern, as I like to call it. And so what you're seeing here is the, the anisotropy in emission direction. So in the center, you're basically looking, you're observing the normal direction light emission, which we actually can't see. If you, if you look at the uh, back plane, you see a, a black dot that's corresponding to the missing segments of solid angle from the aperture in the mirror where the beam passes through. And so um, once we've remapped into angle space, I can add some scale bar so that you can kind of 
get a better understanding of what we're looking at. So uh, here you have, you know, the polar angle, you know, that's away from the normal and, you know, the other angle where you can see rotation. So I typically won't display the scale bars, just know that that's basically what we're looking at from here on. So that's how we do uh, angle resolved CL. The angle resolved CL doesn't give us any information about wavelength. So in order to uh, determine, you know, if there's anisotropy in direction and wavelength, um, you need to add another dimension to this data, and that dimension is uh, wavelength. So one way to do it would be to introduce a series of optical filters, or very, very narrow band uh, bandwidth optical filters that would, you know, trim the amount of light that makes it through this um, this imaging relay. But <clears throat> another way you could do it is to collect all of the, so to use the spectrometer to collect all of the wavelengths at the same time and just uh, serially collect angle space. And so that's what we do. So we introduce a rectangular aperture and we block out most of uh, the light that passes through or, or light from the back plane of the image of the mirror. And so we're just looking at a small segment of angle space. And so once that's projected through the spectrometer, we disperse it onto the camera. And so we're collecting um, kind of a family of angles, um, but for all wavelengths at the same time. And so once we've collected, you know, the first image, then you just collect another set of, uh, subset of angles, and then you iterate and collect another subset of angles, and we stack those up until we can transform them. So this is an example of a micro LED ensemble uh, where, uh, you know, you can see the periodicity almost matches what we saw in the example. And so this is what the, the emission pattern for angle result CL looks like. So you can see a bit of anisotropy. There's an enhancement, you know, somewhere around the, the 50 degree angles. Um, it's a little bit brighter there than it is in the center uh, and the outside. But it doesn't give us any information about wavelength. So we can see there's anisotropy there. You know, it's much, much brighter going out at 50 degrees than it is in the normal direction. Um, so how do we establish uh, what direction the colors are going? And we apply uh, wavelength and angle to resolve CL. So this is the single pillar by itself, which is not very interesting. It's got a bright around the band gap. And then you can kind of see some fringing occurring on the outside of the pattern here. So there's some, some interference effects, but um, it's again, it's a single pillar by itself. There's nothing around it for several hundred micron. We can compare that to the behavior of uh, the wavelength and angular CL emission pattern in an array. And what we see there is vastly different. So you can see lots of anisotropy. You can see basically the, sh the crystal structure here. You see a lot of that hexagonal um, shape in the emission pattern. And you also see it kind of change and bloom, um, you know, as we process through wavelength. And so this is kind of a, a wavelength specific or a wavelength resolved extraction. So I just took, you know, a, a small subset of wavelength. And this is uh, kind of the emission pattern that you would get. It doesn't give us a tremendous amount of information, except for now you know what direction 645 nanometers is going. But we can convert the entire subset of data into a wavelength and angle resolved, um, I'm sorry, an energy momentum diagram. So now we have an energy momentum uh, basis diagram where we can see kind of the band structure along a given angle. So um, we're rotating through and looking at the different angles in that case, but you can see some clear banding um, available here. So cathodoluminescence reveals local emission properties with nanometer scale resolution. Uh, micro LEDs in an array have enhancement, which is almost certainly a photonic effect. Um, wavelength and angular resolved CL is critical for analyzing uh, photonic crystals and anything with uh, emission anisotropy, um, which has uh, so work ha or CL has applications ranging from photonic and plasmonic energy momentum mapping again down to device characterization and failure analysis. 
Now, um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand off to my colleague David Stowe uh, to discuss instrumentation. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for that. Um, let me see, make sure that everybody can share my screen. Um, Jonathan, could you confirm that you can? Absolutely, I can my, see you. You can see it. Can you? You can see my presentation. Correct. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for the talk. So, um, my name's David Stowe. I'm a product manager for Cathodal Luminescence Tools at Gatan. And at this workshop today, I'm uh, planning on giving you a brief introduction to the tool that we're going to see running on the microscope today. So it's a tool that's called the Monarch Pro, and it was introduced um, fairly recently. Now, as Jonathan showed you, um, the cathodal luminescence is performed in an electron microscope, and we use a focused electron beam to excite a specimen. So we have um, energetic, fast electrons that generate that stimulate a number of processes within a sample. And this electron beam can be focused down to sub-nanometer probe sizes to excite a specimen. And so we can investigate all sorts of um, optical properties of a materials down at that length scale because we have such a fine probe size. This is orders of magnitude greater or finer than you can perform with you know, far-field optical characterization, and it's even orders of magnitude better than you can perform with near-field optical techniques. So it's a very advantageous technique for um, analyzing a lot of um, optical properties of uh, semiconductor crystals, photonic crystals, plasmonic samples, um, a very wide range of um, and the way we do this is by um, adding a cathodal luminescence detector on the side, which is built around a, a spectrograph. So a spectrometer that allows us to analyze the wavelength distribution of the light um, that's emitted. However, it's much more than just a simple basic spectrometer. There are a lot of transfer optics um, and clever things that happen inside us, inside the tool that allows us to analyze the light in in various different ways. So I'm gonna introduce some of those in the next slide, and I apologize if um, some of you are already very familiar with the technique, but these are, um, I know that there are a number of people who are new to the technique, so I'm gonna go through things um, fairly slowly, at least to begin with. So in total luminescence microscopy, it's actually been around for um, a number of years now, but it's only in the last five years or so where people have really started um, showing an interest in nanophotonics. So historically, people have used cathodal luminescence as a way of gaining spatial information about a sample. And often that was um, some kind of semiconductor material or um, insulating material where we're looking at a luminescence effect that arises from. And here we get spatial information about the emission intensity or the emission probability is a function of position across the surface of the sample. You can also analyze the light in terms of its wavelength distribution to capture a spectrum in the wavelength basis. And of course, you can convert that into energy. And when we have those two things together, both spatial and spectral information, we can collect something called a image or a hyperspectral data set, where for every position on the specimen, we capture a full um, cathodal luminescence spectrum, so the emission spectrum. When you do this, you have the complete spatial and spectral information about the sample, and it allows us to uh, determine the emission probability at each location on the sample surface and um, correlate that to the local density of optical states, for example. Now, historically, cathodal luminescence has been a very challenging technique to perform, both experimentally difficult because of the way, um, because you've had to compromise between the quality of the data that you can get and the time that it takes to get the data. That was often because the optical design of these systems was relatively poor. Um, it was a limited ability to analyze the lights. As I mentioned, we 
could collect spatial and spectral information, but there was no way to determine the angular distribution of the emitted light or its polarization state. In many cases, you have to be a real expert in order to be able to get any results at all, particularly in challenging specimens. And also um, of, of interest to people who are uh, more probably in the semiconductor field is that it restricted your ability to correlate the, um, the optical and el electronic information you've got with the structural or compositional information because the way that systems were designed prevented you from um, capturing all of the information that's available to you in Monarch Pro, which we introduced about 18 months now, really redefines what's possible on microscopy. So it, it has a much superior sensitivity, absolutely unprecedented sensitivity, which means that we have the ability to capture the highest quality spectra in images in the shortest time. Look at a lot of new materials that we simply didn't have the sensitivity to look at before. Brand new analytical capabilities, which Jonathan has already introduced a little bit, and I will um, talk a little bit more and we'll spend some time going through those on the microscope. Um, but also really, really importantly, especially for the types of applications we're discussing today, is that it has um, easy operation for everybody who comes to use the microscope. So here's those uh, common analysis modes that I showed you earlier. So these are actually data sets captured with our previous generation system. And as I go through this slide, you can see that the Monarch system delivers just simply much higher quality um, data. And so we have access now to study things in a much shorter amount of time or a much wider range of materials. And these nanophotonic samples really fall into that category. What was almost impossible to investigate with, um, with older systems, the Monarch really, really allows you to do this straightforwardly. So if we um, take a look at an example of that, this is um, a two-dimensional material boron nitride and on the left hand side is um, an example of an image captured or a map captured with a previous generation system and you can compare that to um, the monarch detector and we see this dramatic improvement in signal to noise acquired at the same time on the same microscope it's an absolutely side by side comparison and that uh, that increased sensitivity allows us to do much more complicated analysis like this hyperspectral analysis at deep ultraviolet wavelengths where we can map the electronic properties in this case um, with very fine spatial resolution in just a few minutes just or a few tens of minutes in this case something that you just couldn't do previously i'm not going to spend too much time on this slide today but um, the monarch detector we've also made lots of improvements in the way that we collect um, signals within other signals within the electron microscope so we can we can not only capture better cathodal luminescence data but we can also allow access to all of the other signals which are available inside the electron microscope too so allow you to use your in-lens detectors and one of the things that the monarch has really brought to the table is these brand new analysis modes that Jonathan introduced previously in um, his presentation. We were able to capture the emission pattern from a specimen, so a resolved cathodal luminescence data set, where we can determine the angle at which a photon left a specimen, so it allows us to perform momentum spectroscopy. And we can also analyze that in terms of the wavelength distribution as well. So wavelength and angle resolved. And this is what allows us to perform um, energy momentum spectroscopy that we've already talked about today. And the um, other part of the um, analysis that's been used with the Monarch is this uh, polarization. So our polarization capability can be used with any of the modes that we've discussed already today and so we can have wavelengths, angles, spatial and polarization information all in the same data set. So it's a really powerful way of um, studying nanostructures, light emitting devices 
understanding how light and matter interact far below the optical diffraction limit, and particularly um, these deep sub-wavelength structures like optical nanoantennas and cavities. So angle resolved cathodal luminescence, um, as Jonathan showed you, we use an electron beam, swift, fast electrons to excite. And then we measure the emitted radiation from that sample. And then we analyze that in terms of the direction at which a photon left the surface of the sample. The way that we do that is to capture an image of the back plane of the collection mirror. And each pixel in that image corresponds to a unique emission direction. This data that I'm showing you here is actually um, transition radiation from a gold film. So there's no spatial information to be seen, but we could. Want. And you see the very typical transition radiation profile, that donut shape, um, donut shape pattern to the um, to the emission profile from uh, of transition radiation. And we have excellent, not only spectral resolution that I've already shown you in some of the earlier examples, but we also have excellent angular resolution. So here we have placed a mask above um, a light emitting sample, and you can see that we are able to image with better than one degree angular resolution. So that, um, that little, this is a mesh that's suspended above the sample, which we then image the light that's passed through it and it allows us to determine the angular resolution. So we have this virtually aberration free imaging system that allows us to, to get this high angle resolution. Now, angle resolved cathodal luminescence is um, useful for a, a wide number of samples. Um, however, it doesn't contain any wavelength information. So to understand the wavelength information, the only way to do that is to um, introduce something like a bandpass filter that allows you to um, single emission pattern at a particular wavelength um, one at a time. And it's a sequential thing to do. And in order to be able to capture a large number of, um, or a large amount of wavelength information, you would need an impractical number of The way that we then analyze wavelength with the Monarch system is to use an angle setting mask. And we project that image, which contains angular angle information onto the slit, the entrance slit of um, a spectacle. And then we disperse the light um, using a diffraction grating and we collect then in parallel up to 400 different wavelengths of light and then we scan through the angle space to capture the complete wavelength and angle um, data cube because we have this aberration corrected system we have virtually no loss in angular or spectral resolution doing this so now what was completely impossible to do before is now routine. So you can collect these data sets full of um, at full spatial, uh, spatial, spectral and angular resolution. So we're really able to achieve, um, understand a lot of the information about the light that's emitted from the sample. And that really allows us to have detailed you know, photonic band gap diagrams and experimentally measure those. So here's those um, kind of examples that uh, Jonathan showed you on the previous. Sorry, it's... We've lost one of the diagrams. I apologize for that. But we are able to carry these um, this wave event and angle information, and then to transform it into um, energy momentum to be able to understand. So one of the things 
um, about the Monarch tool, we have this very powerful technique. And actually, some of these um, techniques have been around and known about, or, um, or some of these types of samples have been analyzed using CL for a couple of years now. But it's generally been a very difficult experiment to perform. It's taken a, an absolute expert to um, hours to align a system perfectly um, before being able to collect any results. So one of the things that the Monarch tool does is it allows anybody who walks up to the microscope to be able to collect this high quality information about these nanostructures um, within minutes of turning on the electron beam, no matter what their experience level. And so this data set that Jonathan introduced earlier is um, a hyperspectral data, so wavelength and spatial information, but also polarization too of this individual nanostar. And one of the um, one of the really nice things that I like to tell people about this data set is that this was collected by effectively a novice user of, a, of the Monarch system within just 15 minutes of turning on the electron beam. So they had no experience. They required little or no support to be able to collect it. They were simply able to turn the instrument on and through the automation that we've added to the system, we're able to start collecting data immediately. Now, one of the reasons for that is that with the Monarch, we spent a lot of time um, solving problem, a, a problem that has always been there in um, cathodal luminescence microscopy. And that you need exceptional alignment in order to be able to capture these results. So in spectroscopy, just a few tens of microns misalignment results in a dramatic loss in signal. So we have much poorer signal to noise ratio, takes us 10 times as long to collect information and probably destroys your specimen at the same time. When we perform angle resolve measurements, ideally we want this sample to be at the focal point of our mirror so that we have this perfect projected image. You can see that here the light completely fills the physical extent of the mirror, allowing us to transform this into um, the emission direction in that polar plot. But even the minor um, misalignment in one of the axes, the X, Y, or Z axis of the sample relative to the collection mirror introduces enormous aberrations in the image that you collect, completely destroying your inability to. So a misalignment of only a few microns reduces the sensitivity dramatically and can also prevent you collecting any meaningful data at all. Now, determining the focus of a CL system is actually not a trivial thing to do. So the focus of the CL system is some point below a collection optic, but you have, um, typically you have no reliable method to find this. So you can't simply um, bring the sample into focus using an optical resolution. Um, you're unable to rely on the SEM parameters, such as the stage position or the working distance, because the depth of field of the electron imaging system is much larger than the optical imaging system. And it also depends on other things like the settings and alignment of the microscope. It's also ineffective to use a luminescent signal from most specimens. They're either weakly emitting or they show too much spatial or spectral variation or they're unstable into the electron beam so that you um, are unable to rely on what you see. And you can't use a setup specimen because we, as we've already discussed, um, we have this much larger depth of field in the electron microscope than in the so all other systems uh, require manual, a manual and iterative alignment without there being a reliable way of doing this. And so expert users spend an awful amount of time spending several hours aligning a system to um, a satisfactory level. And actually, to be frank, many users are completely unsuccessful with that. So with the Monarch Pro, we, um, we solved this issue by introducing a um, an automated and reliable alignment routine. And that's one of the reasons why we're willing to 
um, hold this workshop is that it is so straightforward, enabled for, for us to walk up to the microscope and, and start collecting data like this immediately, because we're so confident that this uh, routine just allows us to start collecting meaningful data within minutes of turning on the electron beam. How is this done? Well, a facetious answer would be that we simply click a single button in software and the system goes away and does that for itself. But honestly, it's a process of a few steps that we go through. Most of it is automated. And we turn on the electron beam uh, and we focus the secondary electron image on our sample. And we use that focus value then to move the sample to within um, a, um, a certain range of distances from the collection mirror. And for verification, we focus electron beam image again to make sure that we do this in small enough steps that we are um, careful and safe that we're not going to cause any clashes with inside um, the microscope. We then blank the electron beam. And we introduce a laser onto the specimen and measure the um, reflected intensity of the light. And then we scan the microscope stage in the z-axis. And we determine the maximum um, of the reflected light. And this tells us when the sample, this is a completely independent method of telling us when the sample is at the perfect focal position of the system. This is all done automatically, and we'll see that when we um, move over to the microscope in a moment. So this um, really delivers repeatable, reliable, and quantifiable data, and allows anybody, no matter what their experience, to come and start collecting great results. So the Monarch system really does redefine what's possible with CL microscopy. Unprecedented sensitivity, brand new analytical capabilities, and easy operation for everybody who comes to use the system. I realize that we've um, spoken for um, a little while. Um, I want to remind you that you can submit questions and we will do our best to answer them as we have some downtime moments through the practical session, which we're going to move over to in a moment. If you have any questions, please enter them into uh, the questions pane within the GoToWebinar software. Um, and I'll read those out and either I will answer them or Jonathan will show you something on the system that, um, that addresses uh, the question. Um, so thank you for listening so far and we'll move over to um, the practical side of the workshop. Okay. Uh, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> So uh, what you see on my screen here, uh, hopefully, is the digital micrograph interface. Um, if I could just introduce that uh, really quickly. Uh, over on the left is uh, the GMS interface for all of the hardware that's attached to the system right now. So uh, you have a microscope diagram, um, <clears throat> and then some of the Monarch setup tools. Uh, your detector controls, you can turn that off and you know some some various sem stuff so basically all of your hardware is controlled over on the left side of the screen um over on the right uh is the technique panel so you have a technique manager over here you have all these different techniques that we can uh quick switch to um right now uh if we can look in the microscope you can see that the CL mirror is not inserted i'll go ahead and lower the specimen down randomly so we don't know at what height we are uh, and then I'll insert uh, the CL collection mirror just so we can all observe that all right so the mirror is gonna uh, move in from the left side of the screen just beneath the bolt piece a little calibration and it'll back up Okay. 
We're just waiting for some of the insertion procedure to complete. All right, so in the meantime, um, I've got the, the beam turned on at 10 kV. Uh, we can deactivate TV mode and we can start to get an image. So I can mag out. This is our specimen surface. So here's a similar uh, pillar specimen as to what we were uh, observing in the uh, discussion previously. It looks like the insertion procedure is completed. So we'll just swap to CL imaging. And then we'll grab a view. So on the left is the secondary electron image. On the right is the analog CL image. Uh, you'll notice that it's all just noise right now, and that's because I haven't applied any voltage to the detector, so we can ramp up the voltage. And now you can start to see an image. Now, admittedly, it's not very high quality right now, and that's because we're nowhere near the optimal focus position. So I'm just going to focus up the microscope, and we're going to demo sample tune. So this is the CL mirror's aperture. So you can see a little bit of a difference from left to right in the intensity of the seal that we can acquire. Uh, so I'm gonna do a sample tune now. So I agree it's in focus. It's asking me if this is a safe stage movement. So I can go confer with the microscope and say, yeah, I think that's a safe stage movement. So go for it. Voltage is a little high. So this is just giving us an opportunity to refocus after a, a first estimation, a smaller movement. There we are. So you can see the CL intensity is uh, significantly improved there. And then we'll just go another movement. And so now we're actually saturating the detector. But I agree it's in focus. That's a safe stage movement. And so now we're gonna use that internal light source that David mentioned to find the sample surface. So right now, some of the hardware is moving into position. Uh, so we're using the spectroscopic pathway and um, the PMT detector. So, Jonathan, while it's just uh, running itself, we have had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first question is, is it possible to also collect the data from the light ranging from the zeros to the zero to 10 degrees? Uh, in essence, yes, it is. Um, so as a standard, you know, we're missing that segment of angle space uh, because of the aperture in the mirror. Uh, however, if you were to uh, rotate the sample, rotate the normal of the sample such that the normal was inside the included angle space, you would be able to acquire uh, all of that angle space. Okay, thank you. And then um, another question, has the system any temperature control? Um, the detectors are temperature controlled uh, I think the camera is negative 75 Celsius and the PMT. Um, so Monarch can come with either a cooled or an uncooled PMT. So the cooled PMT, I think, is at minus 25 Celsius. Um, the arm, obviously, is uncooled, and the sample temperature is independent of any of the hardware. 
Okay, so it is possible to use, for example, a liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. Um, Absolutely. There's no contact the between the yeah, there's no contact between the Monarch hardware and the specimen. So I've, I've actually done uh, several LN2 studies where we've gone to 80 Kelvin to observe uh, like the spectral shift in zinc oxide, for instance. Okay, so can you just talk us through what's happening um Sure. Uh, so now what we're doing is we're looking at that uh, internal light source as it um, strikes the surface of the specimen and the specimen is if you notice the stage z value we're raising up in height until we maximize uh, the intensity on the detector all right so that's a rough scan so it's got a little bit more range on it and a larger step size so now that we've found um, the surface in the rough scan we're going to go back and do a finer scan um, through uh, the stage that's movement that's a very dramatic change in intensity level. What's the, um, over what sort of distance are we scanning the stage during this, during this scan? Uh, so we started at, it looks like somewhere around 37.6 millimeters and we moved down 250 micron and then um, the scan range is half a millimeter. So you go down 250 and then up 250 uh, from the start position. Um, the fine scan is on a much finer scale. I believe those are five micron steps or no, like two and a half micron or two micron steps. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that the, the delay um, that's taking place here is from the stage itself. So uh, we're just using a stock stage. There's nothing fancy there. And it, uh, it's got a acceleration, deceleration delay in it. So it's just adding a little time there. All right, so we found the specimen surface. So that's found the specimen surface to within a couple of microns? Right, uh, so I've run this several times. It's typically repeatable to within uh, the repeatability of the stage itself. So, you know, I, I'd say plus or minus five micron for the stage. And so that's really the output that we get. I'm going to change this to low so that we're not overloading. Sorry, I missed it earlier. So this is a an unfiltered cathodal luminescence image on the right and the SEM image on the left. Correct, yeah. So on the left is the secondary electron and on the right is an unfiltered uh, CL image. So there's no wavelength information here except for, you know, whatever's happening with the QE from the detector. And so that's how you can, uh, using the Monarch, position your specimen without using really any input from the user. So all I did, if you notice, was focus the microscope and uh, let it find the surface for me. So the information that we're seeing in the total luminescence image here is in the emission probability, you know, some kind of a photon yield as a function of position. Correct. So based on how much energy we put into the specimen, you're getting this much light out. And in fact, um, the Monarch has a built-in uh, picoammeter, so we can measure the beam's current and then assess what is the the light conversion QE of the specimen. So to measure the current is pretty simple. You just come over here to the current measurement button. The mirror will back up to a Faraday cup that's installed on the back of the arm. So this is Blank. included within the system? Uh, yes, so I, I believe this is uh, included in the pro models, pro and up. If we zoom out, you can see there's the Faraday cup. You can say, okay. And so we have something like 1.5 uh, nanoamp. 
right? And so that current is stored and it'll be stored uh, in the metadata with all of the images that we acquire. And you can see also that the image is now calibrated uh, to the current. If you see down on the bottom of the screen, you see the value is about 2,000 counts per nanoamp. And you can move the cursor around to see what is the QE somewhere else. So uh, unfiltered imaging is pretty useful, uh, but we can also use the PMT detector to collect uh, wavelength filtered images so we can go through the spectrometer um, and still feed to the same detector. So we use the spectrometer to filter out whatever wavelength we might be interested in, and then we can observe that image. So let's just improve the slit size in the hardware. And we'll maybe go somewhere a little bit more interesting. Let's see. So here you're performing just a, a, a minor X Y yeah, position of. Yeah, I'm doing a minor adjustment to the X position of the mirror. It seems that uh, this M beam has drifted slightly, and it's it's easy enough for me to adjust the position manually. So, will the focus have changed as a result of this? Do we have to do that again, or are we? Typically, uh, mirror adjustment, you'd only need to adjust um, like your stigmation values uh, or aperture, but mm -hmm. the focus typically doesn't change very much. So this is a wavelength filtered image that we're using the spectrometer to filter out everything around 365 for looks like about two nanometers. So I can change that to these quick set values, 15, 25, 50, or you can punch in whatever value you like, uh, or you can you know, manually adjust the slit size in the hardware control. And so if you were to generate um, a spectrum image, this is a technique that you might use. So you see down here in the bottom of the technique panel, we have the wavelength filtered SI palette. And that's where you would establish, you know, maybe I start at a certain wavelength, end at another wavelength, and it would just acquire an image just like this, a bandpass image, and then iterate and go to the next wavelength, collect another image. Um, However, we're going to move into spectrum imaging using the CCD. So I'm just going to go to spectroscopy mode. And the default there is to use a camera to acquire a spectrum. So I'm just going to deactivate the analog image since we're no longer using the PMT detector. Going to change the central wavelength, something a little more useful, and then I'll reduce the slit size so we improve our spectral resolution. So you're getting two outputs from the CCD in this case. You see the spectrum, which is just giving you a 2D plot, uh, and then we also have the actual camera image. So this is what the output from the CCD sensor looks like. Uh, every pixel uh, on the camera. So in this case, you're focusing the light to a spot at the entrance to the camera, so this contains no angular information, this is just wavelength information only. That's accurate, yes. And so we can move the spot around, get an idea of what the specimen is doing as a function of position. So 
so here you're setting the electron beam to a small few nanometer probe and maybe even less than that and measuring the light emitted from that position on the specimen. Precisely. So now I'm going to move into uh, spectrum imaging. So this is just spectroscopy mode where we can, you know, collect a spectrum from a given position. Uh, so I'm just going to jump into the spectrum imaging mode where I can assign, uh, for instance, a 2D array. So I can say acquire a spectrum image from this region. And so, is the spectrum image the same as hyperspectral imaging? Right, those terms are interchangeable. Oh, let me see. Actually, no, I'm going to turn that off. So uh, digital micrograph allows for what it's called sub-pixel scanning. So we would scan inside a pixel so you don't miss any information, but I'm going to use a small dwell time, and so that's not really a feasible technique. So I'm just uh, getting an idea of how strong is the spectra if I reduce the dwell time for the camera? And I'll turn on full vertical. All right, so about a two minute spectrum image and we'll go ahead and capture that. So while that's um, while that's capturing, there was another question that came in, um, and I don't know yes. whether this is possible for you or not. But um, there was an interest in in seeing the SEM and the the Monarch equipment. I think you know, using a web camera or something. It, it, are you able to do that where you are, or is that just? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. the question. Sorry, I'll let you finish, and then I'll um. I'll let you finish your, your setup and then ask you. So are you able to show us the equipment in the room today, or is it just, um, do you not have a camera set up that points us at the SEM, for example. Jonathan, can you hear me? Ah, there we are. Sorry, there's a mute button. I accidentally pushed sometimes. No, um, so the, the camera is kind of uh, tethered to a PC that won't reach a uh, vantage where I can display the equipment, unfortunately. OK, and then um, another question that came in was, how far towards the infrared can you measure? Um, so using, it, it depends on which detector you employ and uh, what sort of gratings that you have at your disposal. So um, currently installed in the system, uh, I have gratings that are optimized around 500 nanometers. Uh, the detectors have a cutoff around 900 to a micron, depending on which detector you're talking about. Uh, the Monarch, however, has an external fiber port, uh, so you can outcouple light to whatever sort of detector you prefer. So if you, for instance, acquired uh, an IR detector, uh, you can feed signal to that. Um, the Monarch also has uh, the capacity for exchanging the grating turret. Uh, each turret has three gratings, and you can have up to three turrets. So like I said, right now installed is uh, optically um, I'm sorry, visible wavelength uh, based gratings. So they're both blazed at 500 nanometers. Um, but we do have gratings that are blazed uh, out into the IR as well. 
So it's not really something that holds you back in, in terms of IR imaging. Okay, so something around something up to around two microns could be possible. That is possible, yeah. Um, I think at that point, uh, some of the glass optics kind of start to interfere. So you'd need uh, like a lock-in based system to go out into the mid or far IR. So you can see the output of uh, the spectrum image here, and we have a nice little display panel. We can, you know, kind of observe what's happening in that specimen. As a so the, what's, what's being displayed in that image is the information that's inside that rectangle, or is it? Correct. So this is a slice tool, and basically we're integrating, or this image is the integration of um, all of the slices between the start and stop wavelength of this rectangle. So right now I've got it centered around the, the gallium nitride band gap, and you can see the, the GAN band gap kind of emission. Uh, you can reduce or expand. This would be equivalent to panchromatic. Um, and we can see a lot of behaviors that are not consistent across the sample surface. So this gives part of the information that you'd be interested in in a photonic sample. So you can you can tell what wavelengths are perhaps being enhanced, uh, but it's not the full picture. So this would allow you to, for example, map out the resonance eigennodes in in something like a a, a silver bow tie structure or something like that. Right. Yeah, um, so a plasmonic specimen, uh, the beam is um, an excitation source that's sufficient to excite um, the local density of states that would occupy the optical modes. Uh, and you could observe which optical modes reside where using this technique. So you could see the spatial resonance and what mode is heightened at what position. Okay, so we also have a uh, built-in filter wheel polarizer. So you see here over on the left side of the screen, I have the filter wheel, which is presently out. Uh, I'm gonna put that in. And so now this is the throughput through an optical filter that's uh, 355 plus or minus 20, which it's doing and I mean, according to the data sheet, this should also happen. There's some leakage that occurs after uh, around 620. And so this is a bandpass filter that's permitting only a certain range of wavelengths to, uh, to reach the spectrometer. Correct. And so you could, um, you know, image your specimen using these optical filters. I'm just demoing uh, that you can see the spectral effect through these optical uh, bandpass optical filters. But you can use these optical filters with any of the analysis modes? That's correct. Um, either the filters or the polarizer can be uh, utilized in any of the spectroscopy modes. So from unfiltered up to wavelength angular seal. Uh, so I'm going to go to the empty slot and then I'll put in the polarizer. So this is a linear polarizer? Uh, it is, yeah. So the linear polarizer um, lies beneath the filter wheel, so we leave one empty slot so we can go through the linear polarizer. You can add into the filter wheel also uh, circular polarizing filters, so a left or right circular polarization. And so this is how we can acquire uh, polarization filter data. Um, let's see. And so this is the, the ARCL uh, spectrum image from a nanostar that we discussed in the presentation. And you can see the AR pattern here. As I mentioned, this is an angular plot, a polar plot. Uh, you can see the bright kind of along the diagonal coming from the opposite direction that you would expect. Uh, or, or actually, you would expect this from dipole radiation. So this is from the opposite direction of the, um, the resonance. So the resonance would be from tip to tip, corner to corner, 
uh, and then the emission is in the opposing direction. And that's true of all these corners. So if I go to the opposite corner, you see a lobe that's kind of at a right angle to that. And this is um, the unpolarized spectrum image. So you can see what modes lie where. So you can see kind of a little hill around 420 and then another primary mode around uh, 570 kind of how they behave. And I can adjust the intensity axis. So when we look at the center, you don't see much, but then at the tips, you see a pretty significant enhancement in the optical output. And what's the size of that particle? Uh, this one says 150 nanometers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now I'd like to um, move over to mm -hmm. Angular Results CL. Before you, yeah, before sure. you move over, there's a question that came in, and that was what is the spectrometer resolution? Uh, the spectral resolution is going to depend on. Uh, the user settings. Um, you know, if you go to a larger slit, you're going to reduce your spectral resolution. Uh, and likewise for the uh, the grading. So if you use a higher dispersion grading, you'll improve your spectral resolution uh, at the loss of bandwidth. You see here I have 420 nanometers of bandwidth on my CCD. Um, in uh, With this setup, I can achieve a pretty significant uh, resolution. It's around one nanometer for this grading. I think it's sub, it might be 0.6 nanometers for this grading. Uh, for a higher dispersion grading, uh, the, so right now we're on a 300 groups per millimeter grading. If I move to a 1200, uh, you can uh, divide that even by four. So uh, you're down at uh, below a quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere around 0.12 nanometers. So I'm going to move over into ARCL imaging now. And so the system is, is changing state automatically. Right. You can see over on the left the status and the CL spectrometer state. Uh, the status is controller in motion. So basically some of the mirrors are adjusting the, the fold mirror that couples the light into the um, into the detector housing is uh, moving. Um, the slits are opening. So there's a few things happening right now. We'll just give it a moment. Okay, so we're not we're not focusing the light to a spot at the entrances anymore. Uh, that's that's correct. We're now we're projecting an image of the back plane of the mirror, and you'll see that uh, once we start the view. And so that is what I mean when I say back plane of the mirror. So this is what it looks like when you look down the axis of the mirror, and so the beam is passing vertically through this aperture and striking the specimen. Let's see, is it binned? Yeah, it's binned. And so the transformed pattern has a number of zeros in it. I just like to ignore those. And we can move beam control to spot mode. And you can see variation in uh, the angle resolved emission pattern as I excite at different points. So there is something um, significant occurring in an angle resolved capacity. Um, it just remains to uh, capture it. So this is a perfect image of the 
of the back plane of the mirror. So that tells us that the system has automatically located the specimen at the correct location. Yes, that's correct. So the the characteristic of this image, the back plane image on the camera, is uh, such that it's flat. And I think we're a little bit off center. No. Such that it's flat on the bottom and not deformed greatly. So if we were to move up or down in, uh, in Z, or if we move you know, to the outside of this, you start to see deformation or you know, adjustment to the shape of this. You can see the, the edges start to curve inward and the transform is adjusted. All right, so I'll leave it there. So in order to do, as I mentioned, uh, like if you were gonna try to do um, a wavelength and angle resolved, CL image in this case, you'd need to introduce a series of notch filters. So I can show you what one of those looks like now. So now there's an optical filter introduced into the pathway uh, where we're accepting basically the gallium nitride band gap. And you can see a little bit of shape there, but not much. Okay. So um, if there are no questions about that mode, I'm gonna move over into wavelength angular so we can start looking at um, the Warkle emission patterns. So I'll pause the view, switch to work on. So work all is where we collect both wavelength and angular information? That's correct. So we'll, uh, we'll collect a full CL spectrum for a subset of angles. And I'll show you uh, kind of what that looks like. Uh, from an instrument standpoint. I had the controller still in motion, so we're just gonna give it a moment to set up. All right, the controller is ready. And so I'm just gonna remove these camera images and then we'll start the view again. Oh, it's vertically binned. So right now we're at zero order. I'm gonna open the slits to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So as we mentioned, uh, wavelength and angular resolved CL is when we observe a subset of angles. And so that's what the slit does is it selects that subset for us. So this is the projection of the back plane onto the camera. We're looking at zero order right now. So basically the grading is behaving as a mirror more than anything else. Um, so there's no dispersion here and you can see a little gamma to it. You can see that nice back plane is preserved. It's a nice uh, kind of a half moon shape. All right, but if I then close the slit, we'll go to a 100 micron slit, for instance. You'll see the slit close around the back plane near the center of the mirror. So this is the segment of light that we're allowing into the spectrometer. And now if I adjust the central wavelength, we get dispersion. And you can see a lot of different behaviors here that you perhaps couldn't see 
in the AR image. So you can see a lot of that stuff here. And just reduce the gamma again. So in that image, wavelength is the x-axis, and then some some section of angle is in the, in the yes, y that's axis, correct. I, uh, I, I prefer to call it pseudo angle. The the function that describes what angles we're looking at is quite complicated, uh, but the wavelength axis is along the x-axis. Yes. Okay, so it's super easy to uh, look at a capture of that information. So, you know, here we have a 0.2 second exposure time. I'll probably amp that up to about one. Um, we're looking at uh, collecting 150 polar slices. So that's the number, the number of slices that we'll collect. So you could potentially oversample or undersample depending on how many slices uh, you assign. So here I'm going to do 150. Uh, just to oversample the default 100. Uh, we're looking at a little less than a two nanometer resolution. Uh, we can improve that. Um, it, it, yeah. That's why you got resolution? Right. So the, the wavelength and the angular resolution are kind of tied together uh, in this instance. Um, so the, the basically the smaller slit uh, you assign the more refined information you'll get. And so uh, also the spot mode is maybe not the best for analysis here because we're only gonna get information from one spot. And so typically what I like to do is excite either an entire pillar or maybe a family of pillars so that we can get an idea of what the ensemble behavior is, which is typically of interest, especially in device technology. So we can Deactivate spot mode, and then we'll just turn on the view, and then we'll kind of mag in. So there are a few different ways you could adjust in this case. I, I just like to let the beam scan over, uh, it rasters over the image in about, it's, it's one second really. And so our capture time is one second to match that. So you could over, oversample by going to two seconds. So that way we're getting two rasters per frame. All right, we'll pause the view and then we'll start a capture. So in the live view mode, you were looking at a single Section is that angular space, and now you're going to scan through that angle space. Correct. Yeah. So before we were just looking at a slice near the center of the mirror, which is why you can see the the beam aperture here. Uh, now we're going to collect all of angle space, and to do that, we actually go, um, we move the image of the back plane off of the entrance slit, and then slowly move the image of the back plane across the entrance slit. So we're imaging, or we're spectroscopically imaging the entrance slit in this case, but incrementally so that we collect all of angle space. So while that's capturing uh, I can show you some data that I captured previously, which is here. So this one is collected in 200 slices, so it's got a little bit more uh, breadth to it. The raw data is in the top left of the screen. So if I cycle through, you can see this is what the different slices look like of angle space. There's a lot going on there. There is, there's a tremendous amount going on. Um, it's transformed into this rotated image so that we can center the transform around the back plane image. And we can look at, you know, wavelength information there as well. Um, <clears throat> so once this data is transformed, you see this polar map or a, a workal image where I can slice through and look at different wavelengths. So as I move this cursor, 
we're looking at a different bandpass uh, ARCO emission pattern. So there's, again, a lot going on here. What's the size of that bandpass? I can't quite read it on the screen. Uh, it's a 1.9 nanometer bandpass. Right. Um, So this is using digital micrograph scripting. I have a couple really useful scripts that I like to employ. So this one's called the display listener and basically just shows what the bandpass is on the screen. So as I adjust my bandpass wavelengths for the image, you see it change on the screen. So digital micrograph also has the capacity to save movie files. So you could, for instance, attach this listener to it and then record a movie file uh, so that you could just play this as a as an MPEG or an AVI. So this is a, this is a, a stack of emission patterns at each wavelength. I assume that for a given direction or angle, you can also extract a spectrum. That's right. So we can grab uh, our spectrum image picker tool. So since this is a three-dimensional data set, I can show you what subsets of angle look like in the, the spectral basis. So I can grab this portion of angle space and show you in this direction, what does the spectrum look like? And we can move that around. That's a lot of variation. It is. Yeah, there's a, it's a very interesting specimen. Um, so in order to transform this into the energy momentum basis, um, it, the, the function is not built into digital micrograph yet, but I have a script that does it for me. So I just select that data and then transform. And because it's a script, I can edit and change, you know, any of the parameters, how many energy um, segments I want to look at, uh, how many momentum segments I want to look at, and the number of angles um, that I can display. So basically what we're going to do, though, is transform into energy momentum, and then we'll display uh, such that we can see energy and momentum along two directions. Uh, let's see. Just add some scale bars on there. And then I'll maybe ignore lower 55%. And so this is what your energy momentum diagram looks like for this specimen. And as we scale through, you can see a lot of the banding behavior. Um, but it's maybe not as obvious or evident as we would like it to be in some cases. So you can see some banding happening down here in the dark, uh, but it's a little bit hidden uh, because the intensity of the specimen is not very strong out at those uh, longer wavelengths. So <clears throat> what I like to do with the raw data is normalize it to uh, the mean or the, av the local average of the output or of the emission intensity. So I'm just gonna use this uh, normalizer to normalize the data. And so this is an adjusted data set. It's been renormalized. And then I'll do the same energy momentum remapping to that. And you can see the progress is printing down in the uh, the output bar there. So there was a, a question that I um, that I forgot to ask you that came in earlier when you were doing the uh, the angle resolved measurements. Is it also is it possible to collect um, those as a as a kind of spectrum image so that you have 
an emission pattern as a function of position. Absolutely. So the same way we collect uh, hyperspectral image data, where we look at spectrum as a function of position, we can also look at uh, AR patterns. So it's basically a four-dimensional data set, but you can look at AR pattern as a function of position. And that's what we have in uh, the case of the nanostar here. So I can look at this polar map in relation to where the excitation was at the time. And that's where we get this dipolar behavior that we can observe. So this is the, um, the normalized energy momentum. So now we can, uh, again, I'll ignore, uh, let's say the lower 55%. And then we can scale through. And you can see a lot more of the banding that's happening down in the longer wavelengths. Let me see if I can't uh, reduce that further. There we go. And maybe change the uh, color scale. So you can see really well-defined uh, banding happening here. And you could uh, decode this um, using the, the specimen parameters. Um, and you could, but you can see really clear, um, you know, gaps in the band, but we're, we're observing directly the band structure. So one thing that I like to do is also uh, transform so that we can look at uh, along the other directions. So right now, we're looking at rotational directions. So basically, um, you know, I can look at a slice along this direction that's been transformed into energy momentum, or I can look along this direction, but always with the aperture at the center. So we just rotate uh, through the, the data. But if you, for instance, wanted to look along one of these uh, curve directions. So if you wanted to get an idea of what is uh, what does the band structure look like from say M to K, then you would just transform this. Uh, so we'll rotate about the y-axis. And so now you can see the banding from a different direction. Oh, uh, our image capture is completing. So right now, uh, the data's been captured and it looks like we're grabbing a high quality dark image to normalize that data. So just give it a moment to do that. All right, there's the dark image. And so we can perform that, in that same analysis on the data we've just gathered. So we can remap this Oracle image. Add a little gamma to it so I can see the edges. All right, that uh, I agree with this position. You can see the progress down here in uh, the status bar. And boom. We'll ignore the lower 47% again. And so as we scale through, once again, you see the same sort of behavior. Let's give it a couple extra wavelength slices. And I really think it's interesting because this, uh, you see this uh, six-pointed star here, it's almost a direct uh, 
30 degree rotation of what you see here. So this sort of six pointed star in the, uh, in the vacant space there. So it's projected, but rotated. So it has to be from uh, the crystal structure. Right, and then we can collect these scripts. And we'll probably need to ignore, well, we can brand new, manually do it. So you can see a real strong band coming down right here. And then uh, perhaps a band gap underneath. All right. And then we can perform that same sort of analysis here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use the averager on it. So that's our average data set, and then we'll convert that. So this is the fresh data that we just captured. And once again, you can see the same banding behavior. Uh, we can add some scale bars to it. All right, so uh, this would be a great time to take some questions if we have. I think we've managed to answer most of the questions that have come in so far. Um, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to, um, to ask, please make sure that you enter them or you can contact us offline. Or I'd also like to, um, to point you in the direction of a, a website that was um, created uh, late last year, which is a website called whatiscl.info, and that includes um, a lot of information about the other ways in which cathodal luminescence has been used to um, to analyze a very wide range of materials. So if there are there are other systems that you're interested in, what are the material systems or applications? That's a great resource for uh, for learning about cathodal luminescence, the applications, how it's used, and also some hints and tips on how to collect and analyze data too. Okay, so if there are, if there are no further questions, and I think that we will uh, we'll call it a day there, and we'll say thank you very much to Jonathan. That was um, a really interesting talk and um, a very nice demonstration of collecting these really quite amazing data sets from from a sample it's um, been very interesting thank you absolutely uh, and it's my pleasure thank you uh, thanks everyone for attending